we are, last week talked about the prayer of who? Jabez. Yeah, Jabez. And the only thing that God basically had to say to him is that he prayed and God answered. And uh, that's a great example to us. But today, we want to look at Epaphras. And again, the main thing that we have uh, given by God himself through the Apostle Paul is that he was a man of prayer, uh, to be honored as a man of prayer. Uh, I don't know, have you ever heard of praying Hyde? We've told some stories about him once in a while. Uh, I can't remember the where and when of this. It seems like it was in, in England. But um, there was a story of praying Hyde, and he seemed to be somebody that wasn't known for anything except when he prayed, answers happened. And uh, preachers would come and seek him out and say, I'm having services this week at such a place. Would you just pray for us? And then very often they would just count on revival breaking out. Well, let's meet him in Colossians 4, 12 to 13. Epaphras, who is one of you, he says to the Colossian church, he had come from the Colossian church. He's one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, he says hi, always laboring, and this is that word for striving, working really hard, fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete, or filled in all the world will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. These uh, three cities, Colossae, <clears throat> Laodicea, and Hierapolis, were right along the river there. And um, so he wasn't just praying for his and the ones he's concerned with. Now, Paul had mentioned him earlier in Colossians 1 7 and again in Philemon verse 23. So he was an intimate friend, um, one that, you know, the not just an acquaintance, not just one he met sometime when he was at the church. But in these few verses, we find a picture of an interesting man who knew how to work through prayer. So let's look at the characterization of Epaphras. <clears throat> Verse 12a, Pat, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. So we see his connection with the church at Colossae. <clears throat> at Colossae. We find a Paul... We read through the book of Acts, we find Paul did not found the church in Colossae. Evidently, Epaphras had found Paul during his visit to Ephesus and became a Christian. Paul found in Ephesus, which was a great big city, and a, and a city given over to uh, superstition and magical charms and, um, and uh, uh, Lucky Charms breakfast cereal. <laughs> Magically delicious. And... Uh, um, but he established a school there for three some years, and a uh, um, school of Tyrannus. He was offered a position there to teach. What a name! Um, so he must have been visiting. That was one of the the biggest city close to Colossae. So he must have been there and became a Christian and. Then Epaphras must have shown himself to be an eager student who soon decided to take this glorious message back to his hometown. If we go back to Colossians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, I had mentioned that he had mentioned him in verse 7, which is come unto you as it is all the world, bringeth forth fruit, the gospel, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, where do they get the gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ? So he was a, perhaps a pastor, perhaps a faithful deacon. So his relationship to Christ, in Colossians 1.7, he's called a faithful minister of Christ. Minister is just the word for servant. Philemon 23, Paul calls him my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. And here, Paul calls him a servant of Christ. Now, this word 
for servant is the common word for slave. Most of the times in the New Testament when you read the word servant, you can count on it being doulos, which is the word for uh, the, the not, not an exalted slave at all, just the basic slave that is owned by somebody and does whatever he has to, whatever the uh, uh, slave owner says. Uh, Hendrickson commented on this passage, a servant of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus is one who has been bought with a price, like a slave, and is therefore owned by his master, on whom he is completely dependent. In other words, he couldn't, wouldn't have any food, drink, wouldn't have a place to stay without his master. To whom he owes undivided allegiance, and to whom he ministers with gladness of heart, in newness of spirit, and in the enjoyment of perfect freedom, receiving from him a glorious reward. So that kind of slavery is uh, quite a happy one. This is that you have found the best master possible and have dedicated your life to him. And then his greetings to the Colossians, Epaphras had made the difficult journey to Rome to visit Paul as he was being held prisoner. Now we do not know why he stayed. Normally they dropped off the gift that was being given uh, from the church and relayed information. But uh, something about this situation uh, encouraged him to stay. But while he's there, he sent back um, a salute back home, and uh, Tychicus was the fellow that uh, took that back instead of taking the letter himself. Epaphras sent it with Tychicus. Perhaps we can read into it that he felt that Paul needed the support or that Epaphras himself needed the revival of spirit from faithful Paul. And maybe both. Uh, maybe they needed each other. Maybe he could be uh, eyes and ears and hands and feet of Paul that Paul couldn't do because he was uh, chained to soldiers and stuff. Well, let's look then at the key point here tonight, and that is the praying of Epaphras. Verse 12b says, always laboring. The King James margin adds in, or striving. Uh, we have different pictures of that. Striving is, is like fighting and struggling, and laboring could be sitting at your computer, you know, uh, which is tough work. I don't, don't minimize that at all. But, um, but uh, uh, always laboring or striving fervently for you in prayers. This is how he prayed. Paul was witness to this. He was right there with him that you may, and here's what he was praying about, that you may stand perfect and complete or filled in all the will of God. So let's look at the fact of his praying. The fact that Epaphras was praying for his flock while absent from them speaks well of his spiritual character. A believer's service for God never rises higher than his personal fellowship with Christ. Uh, who you are in your prayer with Christ, with God, is who you are in your Christian life. Uh, it's not all the stuff you might know, all the positions you've held. It is uh, who you are day by day with Christ. He was not able to write the letter that Paul could, but he could pray. Griffith Thomas wrote concerning this, there are many things outside the power of ordinary Christian people. And great position, wide influence, outstanding ability may be lacking to almost all of us. But the humblest and the least significant Christian can pray. We have as much access to God because he loves us as, his, as our father uh, as, as anyone. There's no Christian that has greater privilege of prayer than you do. can pray, and as prayer moves the hand that moves the world, perhaps the greatest power we can exert is that which comes through prayer. I think it was Angie was commenting to my wife, and she passed it on to me. She says, it's funny how we sometimes say, well, all we can do is pray. Well, <laughs> that's a pretty powerful thing. I mean, what could you do, you know, with a bulldozer or whatever else, you know, that, that would be more powerful than prayer? God moving things. And then secondly, let's look at the nature of his prayers. It was constant. 
uh, Paul there with him, while he was staying with him, said it was constant. He was praying always. This was not an occasional prayer, but a constant burden of intercession. I could just imagine, he says, I'm, I'm just going to go pray for, for my church. He had reported some of the problems facing the church at Colossae to Paul and was burdened for them. Jesus spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. This uh, picture is what it means to pray always. It doesn't mean that's the only thing you ever say out of your mouth. It's not the thing you, you, know, you never eat, you never drink, you're just always praying. It means you don't give up. Faint is to faint away. Oh, oh, I can't do it anymore. And uh, uh, we, we don't do that. We, we are there talking to God regularly. And definite, he's praying for you, he says. Uh, he might be praying for other things, even for himself, but what Paul noticed was that the prayers were dedicated to these people. It's been my practice to pray for you by name. Things have sort of evolved since COVID, and we couldn't meet, and we, I started calling everybody and getting the prayer requests. And I really like the way that turned out, so we, we keep doing it that way. And then we all get to pray for you, anybody that uh, puts in the uh, prayer request. But I pray through a list of your names. That's the way I remember it, because I can't count on my aged memory to remember everybody's name. So Epaphras did not deal in generalities, but he spoke the names of the people for whom he prayed. He was praying for them, for you, he says. And then intense. It says laboring or striving fervently. Lightfoot called this wrestling. Wrestling in prayer. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that is. I've wrestled with my own feelings in prayer, so on, but, but uh, regular prayer doesn't seem like a, a wrestling. But, but he was laboring. We get, get our word agonized from this Greek word, agon. A.T. Robertson says of that, from agon, originally an assembly, a place of assembly, and especially for viewing the games. <laughs> this is where you watched wrestling primarily. Hence, the contest itself was called the agon, the word being united with different adjectives indicating the character of the contest. So generally, any struggle or trial, testing, hence the verb means to enter a contest, to contend, that is to fight to win, to struggle. Matthew Henry said he labored in prayer, labored fervently, and always labored fervently for them. You see these words build up. Those who would succeed in prayer, Matthew Henry encourages us, must take pains in prayer. We must be earnest in prayer, not only for ourselves but for others also. It is the effectual fervent prayer which is the prevailing prayer and availeth much from James 5.16. And Elias prayed earnestly that it might not rain, James 5.17. And so he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and for three and a half years, it didn't rain. Um, that's a long time. And then this point C is the aim of his praying. What was he praying for? We often pray for physical needs, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but we ought to be uh, concerned for the spiritual needs of others. And this is what he was praying, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. The will of God is expressed in the Bible. This is what God wants you to do, you see. This isn't some mystical will of God. I'm waiting for the will of God to appear to me in a vision. I uh, heard about the lady that reached blindly into her sock drawer and pulled out socks that God was leading. She most often wore mismatched socks. And people laugh at her, but she felt she was walking the way God wanted her to walk. Well, you know, this isn't, this isn't the will of God. This is finding out what God says in his word and obeying it. So Matthew Henry says of this, to stand perfect and complete in the will of God is what we should earnestly desire both for ourselves and others. We must stand complete in all the will of God, in the will of his precepts, his uh, laws, by universal obedience and in the will of his providence, how he provides for us, by a cheerful submission to it. Has he given us a time of trial? We say, yes, Lord. Uh, I'll uh, 
endure it. I'll gain the strength of, of perseverance. Uh, cheerful submission to it. And we stand perfect and complete in both by constancy, staying on, keeping on, keeping on, and perseverance unto the end. So the power for stability that you may stand, that was his prayer, uh, that you will not fall, that you will not backslide, but that you will stand. We talked about the uh, armor of the Christian and the, and the shoes. <laughs> Those shoes were made, they weren't spiked, but they were uh, hobnobbed or something. So you had, you had a thing to grip the uh, soil while you were holding your shield and fighting. And uh, he wanted them to stand. Certainly, they might fall in their own power, the request is in the aorist passive. Uh, when it, you get out of the indicative, aorist means one time in the past, but when you get out of the indicative mood, it, it always refers to a one-time thing. Well, this is aorist passive, indicates that he's asking for God's grace to be given them at, uh, at that one time to enable them to stand. And then number two, manifestation of stability to uh, actually show they were stable, perfect and complete in all the will of God. This word perfect does not mean sinless. That is not our prayer. We are, we are to aim for being sinless. What else would we aim for? Only a little sin. You know, no, you don't, you don't want to do that. Um, but it doesn't mean sinless. They were not, he was not asking them to be sinless. It, that would be unrealistic. But speaks of spiritual maturity. The word complete or filled is often translated as fulfilled. The word is used in the same form in Colossians 2.10, and notice how it's translated, and ye are complete in him. Ye are complete is our, our word, <clears throat> which is the head of all principality and power. So what Paul confirmed um, uh, in, uh, was um, that they were in position Epaphras prayed that they would be in practice. Paul confirmed that they were Christians in their position. They, had, they were sons of God. They were in the family of God. And Epaphras prayed that they should look like that in practice, you see. Epaphras wanted their maturity and their fullness to be in regard to the revealed will of God. And let me close then with number three, the testimony to Epaphras. Paul just sits back and admires this man. He says, for I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So the person giving the testimony, I bear him record. The apostle Paul takes this opportunity, bear record of his friend. I was here. I heard the prayers perhaps, you see. That's how he knew then the occasion of giving the testimony, I bear him record, he hath a great zeal for you. He says, I had to tell you because you should hear him pray. <laughs> uh, Epaphras left to visit Paul. When Epaphras left to visit Paul, the heretics may have pictured him leaving uh, the church in abandonment. But Paul swears to them that he bears the record of his zeal. This word zeal uh, comes from the, the the picture of boiling over. You see, a zeal is something that just boils up inside of you and, and overflows. And then the content of the testimony, he hath a great zeal for you. Zeal refers to an excitement of the mind and the spirit. Epaphras was passionate about the spiritual health of the church back home. I bet he prayed for Aunt Maud's bad toe. I'm sure he worried about that and for Uncle Tom's bad liver, <laughs> uh, whatever he thought it was. But he was passionate about them living for God. That's, that's the goal. That's, that's the safety. See. Now, he adds here, Laodicea and Hierapolis were neighboring cities, probably also begun by Epaphras and the church at Colossae. Um, so he was praying for them as well. Matthew Henry adds, he had a great concern for the Christian interest in neighboring places as well as among them. 
So uh, I, I kind of appreciate that. I pray for open door. But I also pray for the other churches that are taking a stand for God, that are willing to urge people to grow into maturity, uh, not just be babes in Christ and hear the gospel every week. Uh, nothing wrong with hearing the gospel. Nothing wrong with sharing the gospel. That's how people get saved. But uh, how much better to see the way God worked in the early church, and that is Christians won people to Christ and then brought them to church to learn. Uh, this is the great goal, the edification of the saved. Comments or questions about Epaphras and prayer, being zealous?